Welcome to the Teaching Bites Podcast. Here are your hosts, Fred and Sharon Jaravada. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Teaching Bite Show. My name is Fred Jaravada, and we are here to connect you with people and ideas to take your teaching to the next level. And today, I have a very special guest, all the way in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And her name is Trisha Monticello Keevlin. Hey, Trisha. Hey, Fred. How are you? Doing well. I know I caught you at the end of your day rushing home to do this podcast. <laughs> That's true, but it was a pleasure. <laughs> I'm delighted to end my day this way. Good. Okay. So, yeah, we're just winding down also here in the in the West Coast. Okay. So, I know you are a teacher, administrator, You've been an academic support director. I also went into your LinkedIn and I saw, and I knew this already, that you went to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. You got yeah. a master's there. Did you get a uh, PhD from there also? Uh, just a master's degree Just from a there. master's, okay. And I know you're very passionate about helping students and people, especially using technology and the way it, they can transform their learning. And you've also worked with Common Sense Media Mm-hmm. And now you have joined a new organization called the Sprout Fund. Is that right? Exactly. All Tell right. Them. Very yeah. cool. All right. So that's a basic, basic intro to you. So yeah. I'm going to hand it to you now, and you tell us what's your origin story. You fill in the blanks. That's awesome. Thanks, Fred. All right. So I think my biggest thing, if I had to have like a tagline about the thing that ties together all these positions you've just described so generously <laughs> um, and the things that I'm interested in, I'm really interested in how people use technology to improve access and equity and the ways that people can use technology tools, technology resources to better engage with learning about the world around them. That comes out in the work that I've done with students with learning differences like ADHD and dyslexia. Uh, It comes out in the work that I do with the Sprout Fund now. Um, which is a small nonprofit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that works to make the Pittsburgh region a better place to live, work, uh, play, and raise a family. Um, Sprout serves as the steward of something called the Remake Learning Network, which is a network of more than 250 organizations throughout the western Pennsylvania region and also West Virginia and a little bit of eastern Ohio um, that's all about finding innovative approaches to remake learning for kids. Um, it's a very exciting job. I serve on the community community building team. And the core of my work is in convening those people who are members of the Remake Learning Network uh, around um, areas of interest, whether it's digital media and learning, early childhood education, um, or STEAM and STEM movement, uh, STEAM and STEM learning. Also, we have a really strong uh, maker movement contingency here in Western Pennsylvania, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's that's what we get to do is bring those people together around that. I also work um, very closely with our work um, with the connect, with connected learning and digital badging. Um, coming out of work stewarded by the MacArthur Foundation and others over the last ten years, um, and now uh, through a platform called LRNG, um, which we're using in Pittsburgh as a legacy city of learning that has done this connected learning work for the last few years, um, and we're now kind of leading the charge of the 12 cities across the country who are doing that work. So that's kind of where I am now, but my my origin story that took me to Harvard and took me on my journey as an educator really came from my first job out of college. I uh, was an undergraduate major in English and something called Plan 2 Honors, which is an interdisciplinary liberal arts and natural sciences honors program at the University of Texas, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And I worked for this startup um, that was all about creating like ed tech for mostly for corporate clients. We had K-12 and higher ed clients as well, but mostly it was corporations. So I can tell you a lot about auto finance. I can tell you a lot about how to sell stationery and letterpress. Um, (laughs) But we had this banner that said, changing the way people learn. Mm -hmm. And it it inspired me, but it also kind of needled at me because I was wondering like, you know, part one, like, what do we mean when we say that? And part two, what would it mean to do that? And so I really was just provoked by this banner <laughs> to go to graduate wow. school. I hope, I hope you got that banner. You stole that banner. <laughs> I, 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 really, I, I got to call those guys because I need to print a new one. But I, I, it was so funny that I got mentioned this to people and they're like, dude, we just like put that up because it was funny. Like it wasn't like we didn't actually care. I'm like, I guess I just, I took the wrong thing way too personally, man. Um, 
but yeah, so like I, so I wanted to find a graduate program that was as interdisciplinary as my undergraduate program, which was very much about that intersection of liberal arts and natural sciences and really breaking down what can sometimes be kind of arbitrary boundaries between what we think about um, in those different disciplines. So the program I was in at Harvard is the Mind, Brain, and Education graduate program, which is about the intersection of neurobiology, cognitive psychology, and educational practice. Um, and while it brings together important insights from all of those disciplines, at its core, the idea is to be an educator who is a responsible steward of the information coming out of those disciplines mm -hmm. and to be a thoughtful um, steward and a thoughtful consumer and interpreter, perhaps, of the insights that people have about learning in the brain. Um, because there are so many products, in particular ed tech products, that are like, oh, this is totally brain-based, or this is going to change your brain, or blah, right. blah, blah. It's like, what? So part one, what are we talking about? And two, is that even remotely possible and true? And, and we see a lot of those, those, those oh, kind of products, right? These apps, so, right? Yeah, totally. So there's lots and lots of things like that. Um, so that's that has really – so that, I think, was something that brought me to – to the ed school and the other thing that I got out of it was that the mind brain and education program MBE is also where a lot of people who are interested in neurodiversity end up at Harvard because there's no particular special ed program per se instead um, folks who are interested in dyslexia and folks mm. who are interested in ADD and ADHD and people who learn differently in lots of different ways often turn to MBE as a place to look for insights about how um, we can learn things about neurobiology and about cognitive science and like what insights that can have for right. educational practice. So I, I didn't necessarily set out to go in that direction, but that's really influenced me quite a lot, um, in particular with this idea of access and accessibility, um, because the students that I worked with when I worked with you, Fred, at Schools of the Sacred Heart, San Francisco, I worked as the director of academic support in the high school at Convent of the Sacred Heart High School. Um, and it was extraordinary to see my students some of whom uh, were dyslexic, some of whom had ADD or ADHD, and the extraordinary insights and extraordinary habits of mind that these kids mm -hmm. would have who were not necessarily, like, it wasn't always borne out in their grades. It often was. There are many, it's a huge mis uh, misunderstanding that students who have learning differences are necessarily low achievers. That's mm -hmm. certainly not always the case. But there are those cases, and it's really extraordinary to meet these kids who are crazy smart, but whose grades don't always bear that out. Yes. So that's, that's really what led me. That's what's led me to, I've been a lifelong techie. I've had an Apple II in my bedroom since I was like wow. I was four. So I was, <laughs> I was that kid. Um, but I mean, that's, I think that's been the thing that has always been really important to me has been figuring out like, I love technology because I'm addicted to my iPhone, but I'm also like, really into my moleskin black planner like i have yes. the by day planner and man i live and die by that thing and I, i'm on my fifth or sixth one of the little day by day annual calendar and i think that i don't know i think that's a nice way to approach how we interact with technology in the world that mm -hmm. when i say technology i mean both my phone and the ios but I also mean like a codex style book, like a thing I can yes. hold in my hand where I can write down, oh man, there's a thing I got to do later, or I can capture or draw something. Like having all of that together, work together, I think is really important. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, the past couple of years, I've started sketch noting, right? And, oh, I, I, and I do have the Moleskine, Moleskine and I did, I'm just drawing it out, sp sketching things out, all right. the ideas, and just taking that into meetings. And because, oh my gosh, I've taken so many notes on my laptop over the years. I never mm -hmm. once, never once looked back at them, you right. know? And it's okay. just, it's just, there's something to be said about. And you and you know this more than I do about how the pencil or, or the pen uh, moving ar across the paper, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I I agree. It's like it has to be a mixture of the shiny tech and the old school yeah. tech, right? Well, and like that's the thing that I love with the work that I do with Common Sense Media. I've I've worked since uh, May 2013 as a reviewer for their website for educators, graphite.org. And since uh, the beginning of 2015, I've worked as the assistant editor of the site. So I was doing the math and I had eyes on more than 500 tech products, ed tech products last year. Wow. And just in 2015, I'm like, over time, it's been like <laughs> a couple hundred. I'm like, good heavens. Um, when I actually look back at the numbers, it's really quite 
striking. Um, but it's interesting because like so many of them are so shiny and so cool looking, but on common sense, like the things that we are looking at are like scoring a product on engagement, support, and pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And it's nice because it can reward something that is especially shiny and especially appealing visually or from a user experience perspective on the engagement score or on the support score if it's really easy to sort out what you're supposed to do and how it works and how you get help. But if the pedagogy score is crummy, like if it doesn't actually teach you anything, like if it's essentially like a fancy flashcard deck, mm -hmm. like flashcards are super helpful for a lot of reasons. But they're not the end-all, be-all of really uh, rigorous deep learning by any stretch of the imagination. So, like, I mean, that's the—I think that's the one of the exciting things. But it's also like <laughs> it really, like, it really surfaces the things that are not especially transformative as learning right. experience. So, I went through college doing all those, those, the, the, all the, uh, all the, uh, all the, Flash all the flashcards. <laughs> work there are some things for which they are ideal you know right. like when you need to work on rapid recall of a thing mm -hmm. like flashcards are perfect i love quizlet i love brainscape like being able to like rank there's a color ordering thing you can do like you can say as you look at a flashcard you can like indicate whether this is one that you totally knew yes. or this is one that you need to come back to i really like that feature because it, it allows the user to really consider and be really honest about like, okay, did I really know that one? Or is that something I should probably review three or four more times? And then the, right. the, the algorithm of it adjusts. So you can see that card that you were a little more iffy on more frequently. Hmm. Okay. That's awesome. That's great stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think we should just end the podcast episode there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 we're not going to do that. Okay. So what, well, I can I can hear it in your voice. So why do you do this? Why? Why, why? do you do what you do? <laughs> um, because I like helping people, mm -hmm. and I think I've learned. I think I've been incredibly fortunate in my life that I have had an extraordinary education. I have had amazing teachers whose words and whose actions have resonated with me so much like I still like one of the most transformative teachers I had was my high school theater teacher uh, Sandra Erlinson um, and like the first day of my sophomore year in high school like we came into the room and she was she was subbing for like the theater two like underlings mm -hmm. um, and she's like the advanced theater like head of the department like just this absolutely extraordinary gravitas this woman has um, and she like comes in and she says to us a sophomore she's like if you guys flake, you're done with me. Like, if you, if I ever see you wasting a moment, you're doing it wrong. You are supposed to always be trying, always be working. Don't ever be bored. Don't ever be at a loss for getting things done. And I was like, for, so we're all like almost like freaking out, crying as she's saying this. Mm -hmm. so it's like, oh my god, she's terrifying. Um, but like the, I think that really resonated with me. And like, I've had so many teachers who really challenged me and said things like that of like. You have, I mean, it's the with great power comes great responsibility thing, right? There's right. a certain of Spider-Man in this. But, like, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to say, like, you have great resources at your disposal. Don't waste your time or anybody else's. Yes. Um, so I, I just, I think I've had, I've just had so many teachers who've inspired me. And I felt so, I don't know, I felt so inspired to pass that on to other people. Right. Because I know how profoundly that has impacted my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that I have something that I'm good at is having a kind of encyclopedic knowledge for stuff that I look at. Like, so looking at all these tech products, like there are some that are more memorable than others for sure. But like I, something I am good at is for somebody to ask me today, I had somebody email me and say, Hey, I'm looking for some mind mapping software. And I'm like, Oh, I remember three really cool ones that I looked at in 2014. Like, check this out. Like I'm pretty adept at that kind of thing, which is incredibly helpful when you work as a teacher or you work as an administrator or in the nonprofit education work that I'm in now. Like, I think it's, I just really like helping people. And I like, I like being able to connect people with resources that empower them. And I think that both, I think the thing that is most important to me really is the relationships that you build. Because I think that, like, at the end of the day, we are nothing but the love that we share with other people like that's it in the whole world right. truly and like 
<laughs> like wow. I, it's true though, right it's true but, it's all true but i mean i think that i think that's the thing that is important in teaching is this capability to connect with your students not in a way that's like supposed to be self-serving on the part of the teacher but to use the opportunity to serve your students and their parents and make their lives a little bit better than they were when they first met you like right. that's it and like if i can use my like breadth of knowledge about different approaches to teaching and about understanding like a certain amount of learning in the brain and tools and resources that avail are available to people. Um, and the like, I think the thing that the, something that I think has really helped me in my career has been like understanding when I talk about like tools and resources that are available to kids is like understanding like the, the spectrum of capabilities that their teachers have. Um, like, I have found in working with kids with learning differences, like some of my greatest allies have been the more seasoned veteran 30 years in the classroom teacher. Um, because you can talk to one of those teachers and be like, hey, this kid has these challenges, they have these needs, and they're also really strong in these ways. That teacher has seen a kid with similar challenges and similar strengths five times in their career. And they can go, oh, I totally remember Sally was like this or Sam was like that. I totally mm -hmm. know the approach to use with that kid. Um, and meanwhile, a newer teacher who maybe if we're lucky took a class in special ed, like as an undergrad, um, or as a master's student, like they will have some context that's also helpful, but they may have a different arsenal of tools to draw upon to really help that kid. So, I mean, I think that that's something that I, I've been really proud of as we, is the developing the rapport with students and their families to help them, but also like working with faculty members, um, to, help them navigate like the challenges that the students have and also to um, help do what I can to support their development as professionals and my own development too right. and try to learn from them and try to improve my practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you got into teaching, when you first started to teach or... Yeah. Uh, what, what's your, uh, what was the aha moment that you had that you knew teaching was for you? I mean, I think I've had a lot of them. It's interesting, as you say that, like one thing that comes to mind is um, an interaction. So I don't know if you remember where my office was at Convent, but my office is in like a By the stairs, by the yeah, stairs, the right? The building, for your listeners, the building at Schools of the Sacred Heart are all the historic mansions in the Pacific Heights neighborhood in San Francisco. Right. And many in, at Convent and Sacred Heart High School, the historic flood mansion, like a lot of the offices are like the servants' quarters. So there's like this narrow little back stairway and like mm -hmm. every day I'm carrying my bike up and hitting all the walls and I'm sorry for all the scuffs I left, but I really tried. <laughs> oh, we got to paint it, I think. We were good. I paint it every year and it's mostly my fault. Um, but, but I remember one day that I was standing in the doorway of my office and one of my, my French students who was a student that I just adored, like was walking up the stairs and... Wait, 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 you, wait. You, 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 you taught French too, right? Yeah, I taught French. Okay, um, good. <laughs> yeah, so I taught French uh, my last year at Convent and she was walking up the stairs and she said, Ms. Keevlin, like, your class is the only class I don't have an A in. And I, I was, it was the end of the day and I was a little tired and I was a little perhaps more flipped than I normally would have been. Mm -hmm. And she said, Ms. Keevlin, your class is the only one I don't have an A in. And I said, do you deserve an A in my class? And she paused. You said, well, no. <laughs> well, was well. Like, I was like, well, okay. But it was, I think that moment is the best, one of the best examples I have just in my mind of like, never underestimate how knowledgeable kids are about their own abilities mm -hmm. and how willing, even the most surprising moments they are to be self-reflective. Like if you give kids the space to reflect on their learning. And this was not a good example of that. Like we were in the hallway, like people were moving around, the classes were changing, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, but I also had a rapport with the student that we could have that conversation. I could host that conversation. But like, I don't know. I think, I think that's the thing that inspires me about teaching is how much the students never cease to surprise you. Yes. And like these moments of just, these moments of absolute grace. Mm -hmm. of just like, holy smokes, you people are amazing. You small people are not to be underestimated in <laughs> <laughs> like in your ability to to be creative and to be thoughtful right. and to to transform my understanding like it's the most energizing job in the world it is and i yes i agree with you okay <laughs> so you're where you're at now 
all these years of teaching and all this experience. Yeah. If you can tell, what's the one thing that you'd wish you had known before you even started this whole journey? Oh, man. One thing I wish I had known. I think I read a great article about this a few weeks ago about, like, we don't, in the media, appropriately characterize, like, what it takes to be a teacher. Like, there's so many, like, movies that are about, like, green teacher goes and teaches in unruly urban district or goes and like is there to save the world and it all turns out okay or like everything has got to be dead poet society or right. nothing and it's like you know actually like the work of being a teacher like I think about my colleague at my first teaching job when I worked in Houston I worked at the, a small uh independent school there and my colleague who was the chemistry teacher and a dear friend of mine um we talked the first, like, it was the first time I was going to have the summer off, quote unquote. And I was like, so what do you do in the summer? And she, like, looked at me like I was a crazy person. She's like, I redo the whole year and I plan for the year ahead. Are you freaking kidding me? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, I was like, that's what this is. And she talked, like, she actually told me about her process because she was a patient, kind person. And I was, she was very kind with me as a mm -hmm. total, like, idiot as a first year teacher, like, not understanding. And she was like, no, I, I truly, I sit down. And I go through every single one of my lectures and I think about how it went and how it could go better. And I think about like, what's the beginning, like the st structurally, like what's the beginning of the class? Like what's the hook? What are the activities? Where have the students struggled? Where do they need more support? Like what can I provide? I think like that was like such an extraordinary revelation of going, holy smokes, this job is so much more mm -hmm. than people give it credit for. Like the, all of the different things that you are balancing in terms of the, the rush to the end of the year and the pressure to make sure that you address so many different needs, um, you know, not, not to mention the extraordinary needs of your students, but also like all the things you got to get done before the end of the year and all of the things that happen in the school year that don't necessarily get in the way, but there are other factors to consider. Like, mm -hmm. I just feel, I just, I think that's something I would have loved to know. I think it's something that I, it didn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have deterred me, but I think it changes your approach to understand, like, what it really takes. It's not just about, like, having a captive audience, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's about, like, the way that, the way that you're going to deliver information, not like you're pouring it into a vessel, but, like, you're sharing it with, many different listeners and many different minds that are going to consume that information and then do something else with it. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's the one, that's the one thing I wish I, I, I also knew also, right? <laughs> like yeah. what? We work through the summers also. What? Like, it's like people are like, summer's off. I'm like, don't ever say <laughs> No, that. not really. It's we not, don't. That's not, so true. not true. It's so not true. <laughs> I, I had a not... great conversation. I had a great conversation with the um, school technology coordinator this afternoon and she's hoping to do this digital badging work that I do a lot of work on here in Pittsburgh um, for the fall. And it's so interesting because somebody mentioned to me, they're like, well, they, they're not going to do it to the fall. Like, why are they doing this now? And it was like, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> got to do it now. Yes. It's April, baby. This is prime time. Like, right. It's the best yeah. time, actually. Yeah. It is the best time because you can really start, like, evaluating how the year went and start mm -hmm. thinking expansively about, like, okay, what's my plan? How can I ramp this up? And... Like that's been, I think that's been the most interesting thing for me, like working in a nonprofit versus working in a school, like the rhythm of the day is so different. Right. Um, not in a bad way, but in a way that like in a school, like there are obviously the periods of the day and the movement of the students through their different classes and all that, but also like there will always be some kind of disaster or some sort of like, there's always a thing, right? Mm -hmm. That happens every day. That means that the hour you were going to spend doing this thing probably will be spent doing this other thing. And to work in a place where, like, you can come in and go, like, I really have three hours to do this task. And I, <laughs> the whole, I get to do all of that and right. no one's going to stop me. No one's going to bother you. No one's yeah. going to call you out. Yeah. <laughs> which is, like, it, which is weird because I really, I actually miss the kids a lot. It's, it's very different to not be in a school. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's fascinating that that's the thing I notice most is the, the rhythm of like how the day goes and it, it really makes you realize how important the summer months are because getting that those long periods of time 
where you can like really concentrate on what do I want my class to be about? What do I want the year to be about? Um, what's the learning journey of this going to look like for each kid in my class? Mm -hmm. um, that's not something that you can do. I don't think you can do it as well if you're doing it in little snatches of time throughout the school day. Like you do need days and weeks to consider that over the summer. Like it's just so important. Yes. Okay. So I know you talked about that banner that yeah, you should have stole. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's really, <laughs> really a real oversight on my part. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so a favorite quote. You have a favorite quote or mantra that that is definitely part of your life in I teaching. Do. What is it? So, so there's this book that I read as an adolescent um, called "Cheaper by the Dozen." Have you heard of this book? I heard of it. I have never read it. Okay, so it's really good. It's a so it is unrelated to the Steve Martin, Bonnie Hunt movie of the same name, which is really oh, okay. not that good. Um, so it's, what it is, is it's a memoir by these two, this brother and sister, um, Frank Galbraith Jr. and Ernestine Galbraith Carey. Um, and their parents were civil engineers who had 12, actually had 12 children because they wow. thought it would be interesting to have 12 children. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, are they civil engineers? Sure. Civil engineers? <laughs> or like, anyway, but they're like, their whole thing was they're huge efficiency experts um, at the first half of the 20th century. And so they did silly things like they, all of the kids had their tonsils taken out at the same time. And the physicians, <laughs> it was crazy. Like, like three of them were sick and they're like, nah, let's do them all. And like, so all the kids had their tonsils out at the same time and they filmed the physicians doing the work and then studied the movements of the physicians as a study of efficiency to talk about like, which is actually really cool. Like this is the same, in some ways, this is related to the work that Atul Gawande does with mm -hmm. surgeons and their movements and like the barcode scanning of the different instruments. Like these things are related. Um, and it was all about like making sure the physicians could do the most efficient process possible for removing tonsils of all these many children. So anyway, I love these books. I'm a little haunted by them in my own <laughs> desire for efficiency. But the the dedication of the book has stuck with me. And it really, um, I think, is core to my feelings about teaching. Um, it's to dad, who only raised 12 children, and to mom, who raised 12 only children. Mm. And I love it because like, it's mm. the, for me, I think like that's so much of being a teacher is the, the 12 only children is making sure every kid feels like it's about them, right? Yeah, and yes. it feels like that your attention is on them. And this is about them and about their life and their journey. And meanwhile, the only raised 12 children, I think, comes to the, and this is not necessarily what they meant, but it's how it resonated with me, like, resonates with the fact that, like, this is not about me. Like, I'm there to do my work and to do the very best thing that I can to serve these children. But like whether or not they remember me and my particular story and what it is that I'm quirky about and things that I find interesting is actually really not important. Like what's important is these kids and the learning that they get and the, tr the um, potential for them moving to the next thing that's going to empower them to have a better life. Like that's what this is about. This is not about me. It's totally about them. Um, so yeah, it's funny. It's totally not necessarily what they meant from this dedication, but it's like I think about it all the it's time. It's a beautiful quote. I like that. Isn't it lovely? I really like it. I think it's cool. I might have to use that as your title of your episode. Do it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's okay. right, 12 only children. It's going to be a little misleading. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to use the banner. If I can find my banner online somehow, I'll use the banner also. I'll look for it. I'll see what I'm going to do. <laughs> okay. So um, how do you motivate your, your students? So the series of questions that I ask when I work with kids is, like in particular when I'm starting a meeting um, in a public school setting called an IEP meeting, like an mm -hmm. individualized education plan meeting, um, or just a learning support meeting. I have three questions I like to ask. What are you good at? What's hard for you? And how can people help? I think that the more that you can have a real conversation about a student's strengths and their challenges, I hesitate to say weaknesses because weaknesses sounds a little less like a thing that you can overcome. Like challenges as these are things that are admittedly difficult for you. Mm -hmm. um, like let's talk about what those are in a frank and supportive way. So, like, I think that's the thing is, like, leave, making space for failure and also making space for challenge. Like, saying that, like, 
we're not all golden children. Like there's like, there's going to be stuff that goes wrong. You're going to get a C and we're going to talk about it. Like at the end of the day, you're still going to be in the very sacred heart language. You're still going to be cared for with great love. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about how you can do better because I don't think you wanted to get a C or to get a D on this. Like, I know you want to do better. So let's talk about how we can use the things that you're good at to address the things that are harder for you. So I think that's it is like finding, finding the ways to, finding the ways to build on strengths Mm -hmm. um, in a way that doesn't skirt real and meaningful challenges that have to be addressed. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a three great questions. I like that. I I think Um, it's just such a nice way to characterize a conversation and conversation with kids and with their families too right it's like saying like we're gonna this is a safe space for us to have this conversation but we're also not going to beat around the bush about something that's going wrong like i think that's something that i really like in a conversation with students i have a student that i'm tutoring here um and when we talk about her report card or her grades i lead with you know what are you proud of like let's talk about the good stuff because even if things are going badly in one or more than one of your classes like I think it's really important to honor the good work, right. not to like, you know, ov- not to like overshadow and minimize the things that are going wrong. Like if there are things going wrong, but like, I don't know, I think, I think you can't overlook those things. Cause if you do, it's a really easy way to get discouraged. Mm-hmm. So with that, so how can you share an, oh, well moment, like, you know, you tried something out with your students or your teaching and it just didn't work out as planned. Yeah. So I think the the French class that I taught at convent, I was really proud of a lot of the work that I did, but I think that there certainly I wanted to do better. I think that I was so fortunate to have the expertise of my colleagues to draw upon, but I think I, I wish I had done more and I wish I had done better. I think that there were, um, there are projects that I wish I'd gone into greater detail on. And I think I didn't always believe in myself enough, um, to, necessarily deliver on them I think I more quickly like sort of fell back on what was easier which was to rely a little more I had a really good textbook I was using which Mm -hmm. was uh, this um digital text France Interactif which is a um French curriculum developed by the University of Texas at Austin where I attended so totally biased in my use of it however it's free and all kinds of good digital bits to it so it's pretty nice um but like I think I think I relied I think I relied more on the curriculum and not didn't trust enough of my own creativity and maybe didn't trust enough of like going deep on stuff that I think the students were a lot more interested in. Um, so if I had to do it again, I think that's, that's something I do think about is like, I actually think about that a lot, like how I could have done a much better job with that class. I think I did, I think I did an okay job. Um, and I think the students learned things and I think it was ultimately successful in terms of a, in terms of the level that it was at and Mm -hmm. what they were going to get out of it. But yeah, I definitely like revisit, in my head all the time, like what are better activities or better ways I could have engaged with students to like do something more active that maybe would have made them engage with language and culture more effectively. Now I know that that's a very uh, good mark of a good teacher. You know, they always have the reflection and how yes. to make things better. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do that all the time too. Yeah. Like how can I hard, make this better? It's hard right? We don't get another shot at it because at least if you get another shot at it. You have the opportunity. Right. And, and usually that's what a second or third class that comes by and I can do it again. Yeah, it's much I mean, better. Man, being a third year teacher is like the best. Mm-hmm. Like year three, you're really cruising. You've got a sense of like, okay, I know how this goes. And then I saw it happen twice. So it's pretty clear that that was actually a pattern and not an anomaly <laughs> like exactly. year three is year three is great year one is hard year two is better but year three is great yeah. <laughs> okay so what was your biggest challenge what is your biggest challenge and how did you overcome that biggest challenge and how did i overcome it gosh or, I may, think or, or maybe or maybe you are overcoming it right now oh yeah there you go um you know i think that Something that's been challenging, I've been really fortunate to live in many parts of our country. Um, I'm from Houston. I went to grad school in the Boston area and uh, moved to San Francisco as my husband was uh, doing his medical residency at UCSF. Um, And now I live in Pittsburgh as he's completing a fellowship um, here. So I think something that something that's important to me and something that I find challenging is that like being part of a community matters a lot to me. Um, and finding a community, I think is something that I, that when you move is a really hard thing to invent yourself with. Right. So I think I've been, 
really lucky that I've gotten to live in places that had really strong communities and I've gotten to find and to a certain extent impact the communities that I've been part of. Like, um, like I think in San Francisco, one of the things that was really challenging is I was uh, creating the role of academic support director at convent high school. I didn't have like a pattern for how that was supposed to look or a mold, so to speak, or how that was supposed right. to work. And so like one of the things I was really proud of there was working with, like I discovered that there was this thing called the Bay area independent schools learning differences group, um, which apparently was like people with my job in the schools in the region who got together a couple times a year and they'd like invite a speaker and like they'd sort of get together, but it was mostly more passive than active. And I selfishly selfishly was like, okay, I need to know how to do this job well. And I need to know how to do this job in the context of this city that I'm new to. Like, I want to find out what the expectations are of families in this region. And also like, what's the context that I'm entering? What does this job look like at other schools? And so I sort of took over the group and we ended up like I sort of, I was co-leading it, but I ended up being kind of the coordinator of it right. and it transformed like pretty organically because there was desire. There was, it wasn't just me who wanted this to happen. Um, but it ended up being this group of people who had that role mostly at high schools, but also middle schools throughout the region. And we would meet like four times, four or five times a year and get together and like talk about what we did. Like one meeting we shared our, uh, job descriptions. Another meeting we shared a an example anonymized uh, learning profile from our school. Like took out all the identifying information, but like showed how we would share information with our colleagues in order to help support our students better, and how we'd share information with families too. Like so, I think that's the thing for me, and like that's the thing for me is like it's hard. Moving is hard. I think is the big thing. Like moving and and being in a new place and trying to get a sense of like. What is the education landscape in that place? In San Francisco, there's all kinds of extraordinary things going on with innovative education. Pittsburgh is like on fire with unbelievably cool education innovation. Right. Um, but it's like totally a different context. And there's like, di there are different players, obviously. There's a different community. There are different people to know and different ways that folks interact. I think that's probably been the, the thing I've... Um, the thing I've had to think most about and be most, I think be most deliberate about is figuring out like, okay, I have a lot of interests, like the technology piece and the equity of access piece is very, those are the really the core of it, but figuring out where that fits in, in different places is really hard. Yeah. I think you're doing a really good job at it right now. Thank so yeah, very good job. Thanks. Okay. So, um, I know you mentioned a, uh, a, the quote from uh, from a book, from the book. Now, is there another favorite book or a movie or even a TV show or some kind of video or even piece of music that inspires you in your teaching? Mm, like, inspired me in my teaching? Not really. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Um... I'm trying to think of books that do. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, so you know, do you want me to do the editing thing here? Is that helpful? You can you can go straight out. Doesn't matter. All right, I'll just do it. Okay. So, I am a classical musician, and there's this great book called "Great Singers on Great Singing," mm. and it's a series of essays on by like famous opera singers talking about their practice, and. If you sing, like the, there are lots of things that are hard about singing, but one of the things that's hard is that your instrument is part of your body. And so the things that you would say, like, for example, to a violinist or to a clarinetist about like how you hold the instrument, how you interact with the instrument, are very different from how you talk about that to a singer because there's a significant physicality to it. Um, and so like there's a lot of like, okay, stand up straight and take deep breaths. But there's also like a lot of weird visualization that voice teachers and voice coaches will give people. And so like this book is full of like some very helpful advice about how like singing actually happens and things you should do as a musician. But it's also got like lots of really weird things about people talking about singing out of the top of their head and like all of these like fairly like abstract 
uh, pieces of advice that are probably useful to that person because they're an accomplished opera singer and they're mm -hmm. extraordinary, but to like anybody else is really like not very helpful. <laughs> so like, I think about that book a lot when I think about learning, mm -hmm. um, because like teaching is hard and I aspire to be a great teacher. I don't know that I'm a great teacher. I think I'm not. I think I'm a good teacher. Um, I don't think I'm great. I think that that book characterizes to me like how hard it is to communicate something well, even when you're good at it. Um, and like the idea that you might not be able to communicate everything that it takes to do a thing. Like the practice of teaching something and explaining something complex is a very hard thing. Like I have a colleague who loves to say is really smart and loves to say like, it is hard to say a complicated thing simply. <laughs> it is hard to make a complicated thing simple. And I think it's such a great thought. Like that book is full of like way complicated ways mm -hmm. to say something fairly straightforward, which is how to get out of your own way and sing. Um, and I don't know. I think about that a lot with teaching about like right. the, about that translation process of one person knows some information and they want to, use that information not only to convey it to another person, but to help that person use that information for wow. their own betterment. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I know if you, you, you are definitely an ed tech educator. That's one, I know that's one of you are, uh, you're definitely your skills and your passions. Yeah. Okay. So the next question of mine would be to you would be, so what's your favorite tech tool, but I'm going to change it up. What's your favorite tech tools? <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. So the thing I am currently obsessed with is this website. It's called Newzella. News E L. Mm. Are you familiar with Newzella? Yes. Oh my God. I'm obsessed. So the things I love wait, about wait, first of all, my wife, my wife Sharon, she called it. She's a third grade teacher. She called it. She called it News ELA, which it is. I can't decide. Well, I heard. Right? I actually it? heard the people. Yeah, yeah. So I heard the people who have it, and they've called it Newzilla, and I'm like, all right, fine. Apparently that's because it. it makes me think Newzilla, and then I think it's like Godzilla, and I'm like, it's a lizard. <laughs> I like I like Newzilla. I like that. I don't know. I mean, they're both. I bet they're both right because it's not. I mean, it's ELA, like not coincidentally, right? Right. So I think she's. I think Sharon's probably right. Um, but. So anyway, the thing about this website is that it has a new news story every day, an actual news story from a real news source, like the Washington Post or NPR. And it has been rewritten at multiple reading levels in both English and Spanish. When it's rewritten, it is rewritten to uh, not just like the lower lexile scored ones are shorter. It's that different vocabulary is used, uh, different language, and the same ideas are captured within the text. Then for each reading level, there are a series of questions to measure comprehension. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little written feedback part. So you can, as a writing prompt for kids to actually respond to what they read. Um, I just think it is so crazy good. I think it is so simple and so elegant. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it's so flexible, it is at a click flexible that you can adjust the reading level and that you can adjust it up and down like there's no consequence for reading the easier one because ultimately like a bunch of kids in a class whether you've got English language learners whether you've got really advanced very fluent English readers like you can have all of them in a room together and they can still have a conversation about this one article about whales and like that's just really incredibly powerful to me like that's it's one of the most um flexible tools for real-time classroom engagement that I've seen. And I, it, it just really speaks to me for how powerful that is because, like, like I've seen that in classrooms, like the how painful that is for the kid who is not at the same reading level as her classmates, um, for a kid who is not comprehending it in the same way that his classmates are. Like, that is a, a socially painful moment, for an emotionally painful moment for a kid and the moment that they are going to shut, that a kid shuts down emotionally and socially, like learning is not going to continue because they are, I guarantee you, not concentrating on what this article is about. They are spending all their, all their mental firepower is being used on how bad they feel in that right. moment. Like, right. Nuzella is a great tool. Nuzella, baby. I'm in. Okay, so how about the favorite resource for ideas? Favorite resource for ideas. Um, Hey, I like graphite.org. I got to plug graphite. Mm -hmm. No, it is. It is. Can you explain what yeah. graphite is to our listeners? Yeah. So graphite.org is the 
educators website um, by Common Sense Media. Common Sense Media is a nonpartisan nonprofit based in San Francisco that endeavors to review pretty much all media that kids might interact with. Um, the website commonsensemedia.org has reviews of books, movies, games, television shows, and so many apps. Um, and it's all about helping parents understand what's out there, what they need to know about a piece of media, and what they could talk about with um, their kids about in relationship to that particular thing. Graphite is all about reviewing ed tech. And so when I review for Graphite, I review apps, websites, and games, um, and we review them based on engagement, pedagogy, and support. So I think Graphite's great for a couple reasons. There are these curated um, top picks lists that the editorial team puts together, and it's really nice because it allows you to have a really good head-to-head -head look at all the tools that are great for writing for authentic audiences or the best Common Core aligned math apps for middle schoolers. It's really cool. Like you can look through these lists and you can find this whole series of apps and many of them have been reviewed by teachers and there's like associated teacher uh, reviews and also like lesson plans and something called lesson flows, um, which I think are so like true to what you really need in the classroom, which is that you're not just going to like be like, um, okay, so Tuesday we're going to use Newzella and that's the class. Like there's no way, <laughs> like that's not a thing. No. Um, but instead, to like have a lesson flow, it shows like, okay, you're going to use, first you're going to introduce whatever's happening in your third grade ELA class on this day. And then you're going to use Newzella for a minute. And then you're going to use this journaling app that you guys always use. And then you're going to use this other thing, this other thing, and then 30 minutes have passed. Like, that's much more true to life. And I, I like that Graphite is very focused right. on how teachers would use these things in the wild. Right. <clears throat> you do a lot. You do amazing stuff too. Because like <laughs> in, teachers and teachers in general, we all do crazy. We're, we're always busy. We're always doing something. Always doing something, right? Mm -hmm. Now, one question I always like to ask every teacher is, "Well, how do you keep going? How do you do it?" Caffeine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> it is. I love <laughs> caffeine. I love it. <laughs> Especially the pour over, the Chemex. Oh, I got it. Love it. It's a, it's a terrific cafe just a block from uh, where I work in the Garfield neighborhood of oh, Pittsburgh. Perfect. That yeah. is, boy, their cortados are terrific. It's a lovely, <laughs> lovely thing in the middle of the afternoon. Um, no. So drugs, <laughs> drugs. <laughs> it's Kevin the hell of a drug. Um, so, sorry, the question is, like, what keeps me going? Yeah, what keeps you going? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I really feel like I have a responsibility to keep going. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like. I there's always more to learn. I love to learn and I love to read and I I want to know what's out in the world that could help me help other people better. Um because I think that I think something that I'm I think one of the one of the great gifts of going to Harvard that people don't talk about enough is that it's about being around the smart some of the smartest people you've ever met in your life. Mm -hmm. And it is a a wonderful way to get an acute awareness of how many people have better ideas than you do, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a really, <laughs> it's a really important thing to know in your life. Um, so I think I think that's the thing is like to have an acute awareness that there are lots of people with better ideas than yours, and to be on the hunt for them all the time. Right, all the time. All the time, and like I think that's the exciting thing. Like what keeps me going is that search of going. How can I? How can I do this better? How can I do this? Uh, in a way that's going to engage people better. Um, the right, right. I mean, the research, the technology, they get better and better and better. Yeah, right? absolutely. Well, and it's fun. The the work that I do at Sprout on the community building team, like we we do a lot of work, are really influenced by human centered design, and we spend a lot of time developing, um, like facilitations. That, like we did these really fun uh, events in January and February where we were facilitating. Um, some activities and it was really we were really thinking constantly like we did this one event three different times and each time it was different because we kept being really influenced by the experience of the people who the attendees like the participants like we kept being really influenced and going like okay that didn't work as well as we wanted it to why didn't it work and what's a better idea like how can we make this better how can we think harder about this what other tools can we draw upon to make this a more engaging experience and a more um, sticky, like sticking with them kind of learning experience for our, for our participants. Like that's, that is something that I love. I think that's what keeps me going. It's just that, that search and that excitement 
because you can do it better the next time. Right, right. So keep going, keep going with Sprout. Tell, explain to us what Sprout, the Sprout Fund is and, and mm-hmm. what they do. Yeah, so the Sprout Fund uh, is a an organization. It's a catalytic grant-making organization. Um, they've been around for about 15 years in western Pennsylvania here in Pittsburgh. Um, their mission is to make Pittsburgh and its region um, a great place to live, work, play, and raise a family. Mm-hmm. And their three core services are catalytic funding, community building, and storytelling. So catalytic funding has meant many things over the years at Sprout. Uh, Early on, we were more of a public arts organization, and so there are a lot of really beautiful murals around the city of Pittsburgh, and Sprout had a hand in many of those things. Um, Sprout also has had a hand in sort of grassroots funding at the beginning of projects. Like, that's the sweet spot for a Sprout project, is it's something that's just getting off the ground, hence the name. Um, So there's a great restaurant here in Pittsburgh called Conflict Kitchen, um, and Conflict Kitchen was founded as a restaurant that serves, they're kind of, they started as a pop-up, now they actually have a space um, on the campus, next to the campus of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and the idea was to have cultural understanding and cultural awareness through food. And so their menu consists of foods from countries that are in direct conflict with the United States. Mm-hmm. And so they've had cuisine from Afghanistan, they've had cuisine from Cuba, um, they've had cuisine from Palestine. And like the idea is to Help, help people perhaps understand a culture better that they otherwise wouldn't encounter or wouldn't encounter with the same sort of pace and attention. It's an um, amazing so idea. I like that. It's incredible, yeah. And so it's really cool because Conflict Kitchen, some of their early funding came from Sprout, and now it's like this like mainstay of the food scene in Pittsburgh. So super cool. Um, so that's a big element of it is the, the sort of public grassroots uh, grant making for these grassroots initiatives across the city um and then sprout also serves as the steward of the remake learning network this network of more than 250 organizations in the western pennsylvania and west virginia region trying to remake learning for kids um and through the catalytic funding arm of sprout um we've supported many projects that are about like supporting between five and ten five and fifteen thousand dollar amounts um of supporting some new initiative um whether it's at a school in West Virginia that's building an outdoor classroom for uh, an elementary school, or it's something here in Pittsburgh that's funding a public history or a local history project so the kids in a local elementary school can start to understand uh, what their neighborhood is all about. Um, I mean, it's incredible, incredibly cool stuff. So that's, so we do that. And we also, the community building work, the team that I'm on, we do a lot of this uh, work of assembling people, in particular educators, around, um, these big topics of interest, digital media and learning, uh, early childhood education, STEM and STEAM learning, and the maker movement. Um, And then our storytelling arm is our communications team, and they are the documentarians, they are the assemblers of the Remake Learning Playbook, which Mm -hmm. is this uh, book that really is kind of a, it is a playbook really, it's like a series of stories about how you could build a learning network in your own city or region um, and understanding like what it takes to build partnerships between the foundation community, between the cultural organizations like museums and libraries, between smaller youth serving organizations in your city um, and the higher ed community, the K-12 community, like how do you bring all those people around a common theme? Like, what does that take? What does it look like? And what are some smart practices that you could potentially put into play um, in your own cities? Wow. So, yeah, it's something we do. It's do, a do amazing great, things. It's an amazing place to work. I, yeah. I love people. Just now, is there, is there a website that people can uh, visit? Yeah, absolutely. So you should look check out our website at sproutfund.org, and you can also check out remakelearning.org, um, and that's where you can really learn about the story of how we're remaking learning in Pittsburgh. It's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Wow, it's out of this world. It's real. It's a really really fun place to be in education. Mm-hmm. It's an inspiring place to be in education. Okay, so ta-da moments. Ta-da moments. What are you most proud of? Oh, man. Most proud of. So something I am most proud of, like, they're usually, like, silly, like, small things that I'm really proud of because it took a lot of work and then it ends up looking littler than the body of work behind it. But so probably most proud when I did the work with Basil, the Bay Area Independent Schools Learning Differences Group, Mm -hmm. 
we realized what a big gap there was between the understanding of middle school, middle school families understanding of like what was available to them in the Bay area high schools for supporting kids with learning differences. Um, they just didn't, they didn't know what to expect. And so one thing that we did was we created this publication that had a long essay at the beginning about how to essentially what you should expect going to high school with a learning difference. Um, and also what you should expect applying to high school in the San Francisco Bay area with a learning difference. Like what are you looking for and how should you talk about that? So what was really cool is there's the thing that I'm most proud of is like a table on page 15 hmm. and it is like a table of all of the high schools in the Bay area, in the independent schools and the services that they provide to kids with learning differences. Like, is 50% extended time for students who have a diagnosis that supports that accommodation? Is that a thing that is available in the school? Um, like it's a list of all these different kinds of accommodations and whether or not you can access those accommodations at different schools. Um, the answer by and large to most of these questions is yes, of course you can access that because these schools not only are working to comply with their legal and ethical obligations to these students, but like that's, these are things that exist in schools. And I think people don't always expect that. Um, I think that there are so many families that expect that, gosh, when my child gets to high school, they're not going to be able to access their accommodations anymore. And instead this little table with little check marks in all these boxes next to all these accommodations and at all of these different schools, like it's a visual illustration of the commitment of a community to serving its students. Like it's, it's, I just think about it and it's just powerful to me. Like it's, it's such, it's not a lot to look at, but it's a visual metaphor for like this very sacred heart for the sake of one child. Like this is what we do. If the student has these needs, this is what we do. Um, and I just, I, that, I feel really proud of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I think I think that's something I'm I'm especially proud of. Like nice. things like that are a big deal. Okay, so something new coming up. Anything exciting? Any new project? Some kind of trip coming up? Something new? So something new. So exciting things coming up. Um, the work that we're doing this summer. So Pittsburgh has been, as I mentioned before, um, Pittsburgh has been a city of learning for the last few years, um, and we're work gearing up to launch Pittsburgh City of Learning 2016. And I gotta visit. I gotta visit Pittsburgh. Man, you gotta get out here. It's great. I'll take. Mm -hmm. We'll have a good time. Nice. You'll eat a sandwich with French fries on it. It'll be confusing, but it'll take. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta. I gotta watch the Steelers also. I love the Steelers yeah. also. Excellent. We can do this. All of this we can yes. do. So. Um, so one of the cool things that we're involved with is the, the mayor and the county executive of Allegheny County, the mayor, Mayor Bill Peduto, our mayor here in Pittsburgh and, uh, mm -hmm. county executive, Rich Fitzgerald, um, are spearheading something called, uh, Summer 16, which is this mission to get 16,000 youth in Pittsburgh involved in summer learning opportunities. And so we're working with the library and with a local organization called Allegheny Partners for Out of School Time, which coordinates a lot of after school programs, working with them, we're working with um, several partners in the city to like gear up for summer learning and to combat summer learning loss in the city. Um, so working closely with the school district and with the city of Pittsburgh summer youth employment program called Learn and Earn um, and working with our digital badging work to find ways to uh, recognize those out of school learning experiences that can actually be pretty transformative real learning experiences for kids, but don't necessarily get awarded a grade, so to speak. Right. So like, that's the thing we're really, that I'm really gearing up for here. And we're pretty excited about, um, because Pittsburgh is not a huge city. Its population is quite small. It's about half the size of San Francisco. Or oh, really? Almost, okay. Yeah. It's about, it's more than 300,000 students for more than 300,000 people, but it's mm. not huge. Um, definitely, uh, smaller than it was at its peak, mm -hmm. um, earlier in the 20th century. And it lost quite a bit of population in the seventies and eighties with the collapse of the steel industry. Right. Um, so it's, I mean, it's great. We have these extraordinary public parks and there's a lot of infrastructure here for fewer people than lived here yeah. decades ago. But it's, it does seem that they're doing amazing things that they're, they're responding to, uh, to what's happening. They, they, they definitely need the focus on education. They really do. And I think it's, it's unique. Um, so yeah, so anyway, Summer 16 is the thing I'm excited about. But yeah, Pittsburgh is unique in as much as the philanthropic community mm -hmm. is very strong because it was a city of great wealth right. um, and there's a strong foundation community here. 
and just a lot of uh, a lot of nonprofits and a lot of schools that are really um, willing to think creatively about how to be innovative. So they obviously have to be um, in tune with the demands of uh, state standards and mm-hmm. the demands of things that you need to do for accreditation and all those all those really important pieces. Um, and they're also like thinking hard about why do we do things this way and. And when you're thinking about like the steel industry, which has declined significantly, like we still, this is still a part of the country that cares a lot about the maker movement. Like the, the fact that the maker movement's a big deal and our industrial past are not coincidental. Like this is a part of the country that values making things and values um, that creative and generative process. Um, so it's, it's exciting because I think it's a place that cares a lot about its academic um, abilities like with uh, Carnegie Mellon University here and the University of Pittsburgh like it's a pretty significant higher ed community yes. and also it's a pretty significant uh, heritage of the importance of these industrial jobs to the economy and to the just the culture of the city. Yeah I know uh, Carnegie Mellon they're, they're, they're leading in robotics too. How, the, the, Enormous. The we have yeah. oh man we have so many. I know tools. Google's been out there actively recruiting them and yeah Absolutely. I, the, the building I lived, I lived across the street from a, the Google headquarters. The Google headquarters here in Pittsburgh is in a former Nabisco cookie hmm. factory um, in an area that's now called, been redeveloped as Bakery Square. Hmm. And it's really interesting because the building I lived in, they just were building it like when I moved here. I live in another part of the east end of Pittsburgh now um, in a house that was built in the 1920s. Um, but the, the building, Bakery Living, is a silly name. Um, was built on a previously a closed middle school. And it was really interesting when I would use, I'm a big Evernote fan, and when I would use Evernote at my apartment there, um, it did not know that the middle school was no longer there. So, like, everything I wrote when I lived in that building it was tagged Risenstein Middle School, which was really funny. Wow. Um, but, like, that's how quickly this place is changing. Like, right. the, the work that's at cool. CMU is really transformative. Like, Google's here, Facebook is moving here. Um, it's There's a lot of things going on. Duolingo, the mm-hmm. app, yeah, the language learning app is here. They just moved their headquarters into the East Liberty neighborhood um, into a building on Penn Avenue. So I drive by it every day on my way to work. That's awesome. There's, there is a definitely a resurgence in uh, Pittsburgh. That's great yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's exciting. I, I got to visit. I got to visit one time. You got to come uh, out. We'll have a good time. <clears throat> okay, so time saving tip. How do you time? save time? How do I save time? I think I go back to Miss Erlinson. I go back to my high school hist- or, uh, drama teacher. And the idea of don't ever waste time. So the biggest thing I do is I've always got my planner with me. Um, I use the Notes app in my iPhone Mm -hmm. religiously. Um, I think I stress a little bit. Well, I stress a lot about like what am I going to make for dinner and what am I going to wear, which is really stupid. But partly it's that like I don't – like my husband's a doctor. He gets to wear pajamas to work for a living. Like his (laughs) his job is really hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. uh-huh. His job is really demanding, and like it's a great thing that they get to wear this. They have a uniform. They don't. Wear. They don't. Ha- they don't have to worry about choices. About about. They don't have and, to spend res- mental resources on exactly choices, because right? Steve Jobs has talked about this. Mark mm-hmm. Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg. Talked about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like decision fatigue is a thing. If wearing a hoodie is what you're allowed to do, that's excellent. Like, but so I I, I really appreciate that. And like my native costume is definitely a t-shirt and jeans, and I have not had jobs where I've gotten to wear that. So right. like. I, I weigh, it's so stupid, but I way overthink like what I need to wear to work. Um, so I, I think my biggest time saver is that I use my notes app and my phone to like write stuff down and like literally go, you're going to wear the black skirt and the yellow shirt tomorrow. Like that's the plan. Like when I've got a little moment of mental downtime to like, or just like I'm in a, like I'm waiting for the bus or I'm at the end of a meeting or a presentation that I maybe have a moment where I don't have to really be that engaged. Like that's, I think that's the thing is like taking advantage of having something to, having a tool to capture my thinking in moments like that. So that when I need to make a decision or need to actually think about a thing, I've got something to refer back to. Always. Yes. And then you'll, and then you're like me, if you're like me, then I will look at my notes like, why did I write that? Yeah, well, and that's the thing. It's like you have to learn how to trust past self. Mm-hmm. I think that's the thing that I, I – like in the moment if I'm giving a, a talk or presentation or like I am, I've got notes that I've taken and I need to use them for something, sometimes I forget that my past self 
probably thought hard about this last time. <laughs> like, right, right. A, small, a small moment of panic of, oh gosh, did I remember to? Oh, it's like, yes. Last time when you paid a lot of attention to this, mm -hmm. you had a good solution and a good approach and it all turned out okay. I like, like that. Oh, trust your old self. I like that. Yeah, trust, trust your past self your to past have done self, yes. yourself a, a solid. Okay. So we're going to close it up real soon, this episode. It's an amazing episode. A lot of great gems. Now, what's the best advice you ever received? And in turn... What's the best? What's your best advice for teachers? Oh my goodness! So, best advice I've ever received. Certainly, the "don't waste time" thing mm -hmm. is a big one. It's funny. I have several friends like who are having big life transition moments, so like weddings and things. So, like my my mind is sort of on that because I have a dear friend who's getting married in a couple of weeks here. Um, like what, it was funny cause like when people get married, right. They like give you all the advice in the world. Yeah. Um, and like, uh, one, the one piece of advice that I received, which I have given to other people is that when you are, when you're like walking down the aisle or whatever, like take a moment to look around because there will never be another moment in your life when all the people that you love most will be in the same place and thinking about how much they love you. Mm -hmm which I love. Yes. And it makes me think of like, I love the Thornton Wilder play our town. And there's this moment at the end where the, one of the main characters says to another character, like do humans ever really notice and realize life while they live it every minute. And the other character says, no, the saints and poets, maybe they do some. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for me, that's like a, a core thing of like, pay attention. I think that's the advice that I've received and the advice that I would give is pay attention. Um, pay attention to the opportunity that you have to help a student, like pay attention to what they're telling you, whether it's verbally or otherwise, like pay attention to what they need um, and do what you can to address it. Whether that means that you slow down and you smile or you slow down and you like sensitively ask, Okay, how can I help? Like, what can I do to what can I do to make this better? Right. Um, I think that's it. Pay attention. Like, be in the moment. Be here now, um, because there's like that's it. Like, that's the ball game. That is great advice. I love that. Okay, so <clears throat> closes out, Trisha. Tell us how. Tell us. Tell the listeners, the audience. Tell tell them how if they need to get in touch with you, and contact you if so you have any questions best way to get in touch with me is my twitter i am at p m kievlin so at p is in patricia m is in mary capital of ukraine is kiev k-i-e-v l-a-n mm -hmm. at p m k-i-e-v l-a-n um you can also find my website which is pmkievlin.com um and that's my personal website and my blog about various things that i'm reading and amused by in the universe and across the internet um, but yeah, tweet at me. Always looking for interesting ed tech things on the web and interesting things to learn about on the web. Okay, so all right, so Trisha, thank you so much for joining Thanks, our Fred. show. This was really for having me. Was that? Thank you for having me. It was really a delight to uh, join. It was great, and you know, um, we worked together a few a few times also in, in school mm -hmm. and also the EdRev in San Francisco. Yeah, we which did is radical awesome. times. I uh, couldn't do it this year. Yeah, too me busy. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully, I will come visit Pittsburgh sometime, and we'll go get some of the co that that's the great sounding coffee over there. We can do that for sure. It'd be a pleasure. All right. So now, any shout out to anyone? Um, shout out to one of the greatest jobs I've ever had, working at Schools of the Sacred Heart, Sacred uh, San Francisco, with all the amazing Sacred Heart educators there. It was a pleasure, and mm -hmm. continues to influence and inspire me. All right. Okay. Thank you again so much. Thanks a lot, Fred. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Teaching Bites podcast at www.teachingbites.com.